The reason you're here, and you know, and the reason I'm here, is that is the hardware startup story, right? You guys are trying to make hardware startups happen, and I want to help you get from where you are, which is probably a little bit confused, a little bit looking into this big black box of what do I need to do, how do I make it successful, um, to a point where you can hopefully be more confident, understand kind of the bigger picture, what you need to plug in, when, where, why, and um, obviously it's a lot to cover in one night, but we're going to hit kind of the big picture and, and drill down a little bit so that at least at the end of this I hope that you can come away with understanding what you know, what you don't know, and where you need to fill in the gaps. So. We define hardware startup a little bit differently. Uh, I'm defining it as any hardware, any startup whose aim it is to take a product to full-scale production. All right, and the reason we describe it like this is because there's a lot of similarities between that process. If you're making electronics, or clothes, or even books, or other things, there's minimum orders, there's cash flow, there's marketing, there are things that are unique to even this very broad spectrum that are, is very different than a services company or an internet company. And so you hear all these success stories, and you think that, um, you know, wow, this is getting easy. You just throw it up on crowdfunding, and you raise a bunch of money, and you go, you know, plug into your manufacturer, and you're set to go. And it is not. It is really hard. Um, most of those successful crowdfunding campaigns never become real companies, really. They get funded, they have problems shipping on time, they have problems because they actually are selling the product at a loss because they didn't you know, account for customs or, or other things, shipping um, internationally. And so you hear a lot of buzz on the really positive side. People are starting to hear about more of the difficulties now, which I think is great and it's how we can solve them. Um, but it's, it's really hard I and mean, you really want to know what you're getting into. So here it is. So first, you come up with an idea. Right. Obviously lots of ways to do that and I don't need to go into that too much. Then you need to create a design. And so you work with your designer, you do it yourself, make a beautiful design. Obviously there's a whole history of things that go behind a good design and a bad design. Then you need to take that design, you need to translate that into something that is really structurally sound, uh, it, you know, fits the mechanical engineering or electrical engineering properties that you need. You need to test it, you need to prototype it, uh, this is, prototyping is often a very iterative process, you need sometimes expensive equipment, you need to know the right people, you need to know what you're trying to get out of those prototypes. Uh, quick thing on prototyping, I like to look at it a little bit differently, I think a lot of people build a prototype to think that they're just trying to make the next best thing they can do, and, and they just kind of go in the lab and do that, but really I think the better way, if you can, is to try to type as much back into your business model as you can, right? So think of that prototype like a black box, and you're gonna put in money, you're gonna put in your time, your resources, your engineering skills, so forth, and what are you gonna get out? You know, don't really look at it as a prototype, but what you really wanna get out of that black box is that there are answers, right? You wanna answer what? What are you looking to answer? Market validation, maybe? User interface? Cost? Maybe you know you want to begin kind of your sales pitch and be able to put it in front of investors, raise money, other things. So a prototype, a good prototype, really sometimes it can just be a piece of clay. You know, you make it into something that you can tell a story behind, and if that's what you need to raise some money, and that's enough, that may be all you need. Funding, obviously, not easy. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of work to get in front of the right people, some relationships. You really have to be dialed in and ready, you know, for those meetings. Market validation. You know, a great thing about crowdfunding is that you can get that market validation a lot earlier and easier now, but, you know, that's a huge part of building a hardware business. You want to get that early and make sure that you've got something that you want to spend your time and money doing. Tooling. So you think you're done, you've got your great prototype, you've got it engineered by professionals, everything is looking really good. 
in the tooling itself, to make a good tool, you need someone who has a lot of experience and who can really look at the files and, and know what machines is going to go on and, and optimize that. So, something you may not need to do in house, but somebody needs to be able to do this if you're going to be competitive. Manufacturing, you know, there's just a million little things that go in there. Um, from making sure you're, you're trying to communicate these very complicated designs, often overseas, down to workers' hands that don't know about engineering, they don't know about your market, they don't know about all these other things, and, and they're the ones that are going to make your product, right? So you have to have very good guidelines on how they do that, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, how will they inspect that, you know, who's going to manage that. Um, certainly a lot to do with manufacturing alone. Quality control, you know, when it comes off the, off the line, is it really the product that you approved? Does it meet all the specs? You know, it's, it's um, you know, there's, you look at any of these things, right, and there's, there's people that have 30 years experience in any of these industries, and those guys are working at the big companies that you're competing with, right? You're competing for the shelf space, for the guys that have all of that experience and, and are plugging that into all of their products. And certainly it's a lot more feasible, but you need to realize that that's what you're up against. So, so packaging, you know, you've got to make sure it's going to look good on the shelf. You've got to really minimize that shelf space to optimize it for the retailers. It's got to be safe, right? Any product that hurts somebody, and you're done, pretty much. So you've really got to make sure you're taking all the safety considerations in. It's got to be durable. You know, I put this one up here. It's not exactly a field, but this is a really tough one that will get you. You know, this is something that it's very hard to test for initially. You know, in your prototyping, even in your manufacturing, you know, you can't really test durability very well. So when you're designing in, in the earlier stages, you really want to think about, okay, how is this going to be used in the field? Who's going to use it? You know, is it, is it for kids? Is it for adults? What is it going to be dirty? Is it going to get wet? What are all the possible things that can go wrong? And try to be a little bit on the safe side, right? Build in a little extra cushion so that you're not on the edge, but you've got a, a pretty solid product. Intellectual property, obviously, its own field worth discussion. Certifications, lots of certifications, and sometimes you don't need any. Sometimes you need very significant certifications that you'll need to know about. Shipping, good news, it's easy, <laughs> pretty much. You might make a freight forwarder, you get some things lined up, and that's actually, you can almost take that off the list. That's as far as drop shipping. Fulfillment is difficult, and, and um, you know, this is where you now ship all of your product to a warehouse, and you've got guys helping you fulfill, and hopefully it could be you, it might be you in the beginning, and then <laughs> we've got quite a few customers, oh yeah, we're just gonna do it, and a week later, they're like, we're oh, yeah, never doing that again. <laughs> that was a great workout, but <laughs> I don't wanna do it again. <laughs> um, it takes a lot of time, very easy to make mistakes. Uh, you really wanna get your procedures set up well with your fulfillment house. Big ones, small ones, they all have problems. You, you want to use their system and make sure you've really got everything, all the information you need to get to them uh, correct. Branding, you know, if you want to build, you, so you can do all this stuff, right? You can get all the way up to here, and you've got a great product, you're selling, you're making a bunch of money, there's great traction, and now people don't really understand, if you haven't gone to the next step to build a brand, Someone else comes in with a competing product, or they take your product and, and switch it a little bit and make it into a brand, or pull it into their brand, and you don't have that kind of foundation to really keep that momentum. You know, it can kind of be swiped a little bit. So you need to, when you're building that product, when you're building that baseline, you, you also need to be building that brand, right? And, and Apple is just the greatest example, too, right? It's, it's where the real, real money is, right? Anyone can, kind of make a cheap product and, and sell it for cheap, but the real money is when you create that kind of brand loyalty, that relationship with your customer, and they buy your stuff because they believe in you, right? Because they believe that they are your customer. And so we've got distribution, you know, you need to find ways to get it out to the market. Um, if you want to usually play on a bigger scale, it's very, very difficult to do yourself. You're going to have to find partners for distribution. Those are, you know, it's complicated relationships and then lots of uh, time and energy that goes into that. Retail, kind of same thing. Every retailer has their own way of presenting products, of, of 
needing their relationships to happen, and you are going to have to work on those contracts, right? You need to know what they're looking for, what they don't. You have to be very careful. Um, I think from everything I've been a part of and heard, the best advice for startups in retail, certainly working with big retail, is push back. You know, really don't be afraid to push back um, or to not take the deal at all, you know, and wait a little bit longer. Uh, it, it always seems like a great, great deal when you've got this chance to go into big volume. Um, but if you're small and, you know, you, you don't have a real good lawyer and you don't have the money to really make that investment and, you know, you're, you're putting all, kind of all your eggs in one basket. And a lot of these retailers, if they don't sell your product, they have it in the terms that they will ship back the product to you and you buy it back, right? So now all that money that you spent to pay for that product and the income that you were expecting to get from it now all goes back. That has, that has killed many companies. And, and their forecasts are, can be optimistic, they can be wrong. Um, so you usually best advice if you've got a good product, if, it's, if it looks like it's going in the right direction, push back a little bit, you know, not forever certainly, but um, build more traction, get better offers, get better offers from the same companies because they really want your product. And, and you know, go in when you're a little bit more you have a better foundation and are really ready to go for it. Um, customer service, so once your stuff gets out there, you need to find a way to really connect with your customers and take returns and make them happy and you know make sure you're still building products and building that brand for them. So it's really hard for one person to do it. All right, it's, it's to have all those skills and to do all those things is difficult for one person. But if you can build the right team, you know, and I just think this last World Cup was a perfect example, right? I mean, Brazil obviously had amazing singular players, but they just got whooped, you know, by Germany, right? Because they played such a great team game, and they really worked together, and they did their jobs, and, and this is what you need out of a hardware company, because it's, you know, kind of like soccer. There's a lot going on. There are a lot of moving pieces. There's a lot that needs to happen. So you need to build that team in a way that you can plug those guys in and people can do their job and not overlap too much because you know, there's, there's enough to be doing. So I kind of drilled down to maybe the second level to start because I wanted you guys to see kind of the actual features of, of this, this hardware startup story. Um, now I want to step back up a little bit and look at kind of the bigger picture of where you're starting probably a little bit closer to and, and kind of a good approach. So if you're building a puzzle, right, you always start from the outside. Right? You figure out where the, how do you constrain the problem? Right? You build the border and then you start going in. And um, I think with any particularly difficult challenge, that is kind of what you need to do. The, breaking it down, kind of going, going up one level, this is basically kind of what you see. I mean, there's other ways you could do this, certainly, but I see it as kind of four main problems. You have design, marketing, funding, and manufacturing. Whatever you do, you're going to need money. Marketing has to drive everything, basically. You know, and it all starts from marketing. Because marketing, the fundamental question is, can I sell it? Right? Are people willing to buy it? Is there market validation? Is this a product that people want? Who is my customer? How do I connect with that customer? So if you're not working towards that, if, if you're working towards a great, beautiful, amazing design, you may end up with a great, beautiful, amazing design that nobody wants to buy. And you, you, you know, business, unless you've, you're sitting on your you know, $10 million and not worried about it, you're gonna have to make a living. And uh, so it's gonna come down to, can you make money? Can you sell product? Can you make something that people really want to buy? So this whole thing is kind of driven by marketing, but they all work very closely together, right? When you're working on your design, your marketing needs to be telling you what the customer wants, who's the customer we're going after, what is the price point they're willing to pay for this kind of product. When you're working on your design, you want to be talking to manufacturers and, and figure out, hey, is this feasible? Can I even make this kind of product? Or is it going to cost you know, roughly in a ballpark that people can afford, or is there another process or material that I can use to make it um, fit the market? And, you know, funding is maybe kind of slightly outside, but um, all of these certainly need to work together to make the funding work, right? The, 
the investors are going to know the right questions. They're going to figure out if you've played all these together, if your marketing has driven, you know, has driven the other parts of your business, and if you understand your costs, and if you've accounted for those things in your design. So it's not, you know, one of the most common mistakes I see is that you, most people start here. You know, they start this design, 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 and then they're like, oh, okay, now we're going to market it. That's way, way too late. You know, it needs to start marketing, and then, okay, that drives your design. You may have an idea, you know, of course you've you know, got a great idea for a new thing, but immediately take that into the market, right, and see, are people willing to pay for it? Is there any way I can find out? Um, make a little prototype, you know, whatever you can do. Crowdfunding is obviously just beautiful for that. Um, but you need to be doing, the real point here is that you've got to be doing all these four things kind of together. You know, you really don't do any of them separately, but they, they all work together from the very beginning. I just saw this the other day. I had the slide in here for a while, but <laughs> it is so perfect, man. Yoda's got it all figured out. In, in hardware startups, there is no try. <laughs> There's no doing it once and being like, oops, <laughs> let's do that again. Because um, then you only have two options, really. You can rework it, or you can just redo it. And almost always, if you have a major defect that has shipped all the way to your US warehouse where you're going to distribute it from, it's very rare that it even makes economic sense to rework the product. Yeah, so the first articles as we define them are just the first units off of the manufacturing run. There's a little confusion with that sometimes as far as some people think that they consider those prototypes, and those are different. So prototypes would be something that's not made with the manufacturing technology, at least in our, you know, the way that we word it. Um, and so first articles is that first, hey, we've got all the machines, we've got all the tools on the machines, we've got everything up to steady state, everything's after this should come out pretty much exactly like this first article, because it's using all of the same environment, machines, materials, and um, this is what we got. So it's a great way to check, certainly, uh, you know, for this sort of thing, you can send it you can have them ship it from the factory, you can check it out. You should try to do that. Um, the other problem is, if you're going to do that from China, you've got four days by FedEx. Um, you know, it's still at a decently expensive shipping rate, and unless they're going to keep that tool on the machine and you know, keep it ready for you for four days, which wouldn't really make any sense, then they've got to, you know, they've got to spend they spend a couple hours putting the tool in the machine, calibrating everything, going through material to get the color right, and now they've got all that material in the hopper. If they then now need to take that tool off the machine, clear all that you know material in the hopper, make another product, then they've got a huge cost, right? So hopefully you can find someone that can work with you on that cost. Better just to be there or to have somebody there. Yeah, that's a great, great point. Yeah, typically, I mean, manufacturing. And I, I strongly support this, and I think everyone who's kind of been through it for a long time. I think there's two ways. It's one is either to work with someone who's there on your behalf. The other is either to be there on yourself, you know, for yourself on your own behalf. <laughs> um, it's really hard to, um, and unless you've got a relationship and, and you really know what you're doing. You know, if you really know all of the steps and you know when to check and how it all works, and it can be feasible a bit. Um, but even then, I mean. Those, you know, guys that really have done this a long time. I, I, I was on a panel at the Hardware Town with Michael Greaves, who's uh, founder of Play Eye, he's been in robotics for 20 plus years, and um, you know, this question came up, and I asked, and I said, well, I don't really know how else you do it, because we're on the ground, and that would be the only way I could know how to do it, and I asked him, so what, what have you done? You know, you guys have done this a long time, and he said, uh, well, I spent the last six months in China. <laughs> so here's the founder of a large company, you know, doing it for a long time, and um, you know, his solution was to be there himself. So it's it's pretty much the way you do it. The bottles. So I'm going to go through some lessons learned and um, talk a bit about some of the things that we've seen that are particularly useful. I think you know, in the larger scope of hardware startups, you know, that should be able to be applied to most things. So. BKR, BKR is one of our clients that have done this a fantastic job. Uh, this is a silicone sleeve with a glass bottle and a plastic cap, P2. 
PPCAP. And the concept when she came out was to be all clean everything. That was the tagline. So get away from plastic water bottles all the time. You know, use something that was felt good in your hand, looked good, and could replace kind of your daily water consumption in a very clean way with you know glass, no plastic really touching the water, so a little bit clean for health and so forth. And she came out and she was doing pretty pretty well, you know, and people were buying the products, she was getting in the stores, but she heard she had a couple emails, I'm not sure how she got in touch with these folks, but she found out relatively quickly after she came out with maybe ten colors that this one lady had bought every one of her colors. And these are $30 water bottles, which at the time nobody had sold the $30 water bottle before. And there's one lady that had all 10 colors, and she contacted her and, and you know, or learned more about this kind of customer. And she found out that really the driver was the fashion. You know, that the women were buying these different colors because it was really more of a fashion accessory, right? You're wearing this color this day, and this goes pretty with that, and it just kind of looks cute in general. And um, so very quickly, she pivoted. And um, I guess we have a picture from the old one, all clean everything. Um, but she pivoted to basically become a fashion accessory company. And she was, even though she sells a water bottle, she was really not a water bottle company. She's a fashion company. and. If you look at her website, you wouldn't know that it wasn't a fashion magazine. You know, she's got all the pictures, black and white models, all that, and um, you know, it looks very trendy, looks very cool, and you kind of have to search around for the bottle a little bit. There's a bottle in the picture, kind of subtly hidden, as it should be, you know, in fashion. Um, and when she pivoted, you know, it just went great. She, you know, partnered up with some very big. Um, fashion brands and hotels, and they distributed her top-of-the-line bottle through their channels, and she was able to keep, uh, you know, good, really good customer base and, and margin and control of her product in a way that, you know, just wouldn't have happened if she'd stuck with her original plan. You know, it would have been a much tougher road. So, be ready to pivot, you know, let your marketing drive that. Be ready if the market tells you they want something, you know, be ready to go that way. Uh, so throw motion. So this is a really amazing game. So it's um, a tabletop cricket game. So nobody had really mastered the art of throwing a ball on a tabletop game because it's the problem is the speed, really. You know, from here to here, to throw a ball is very, very fast, and the reflexes are difficult, and trying to make that playable is difficult. Um, but our client did it quite well. Um, he, he He's one of the very first clients I met um, 10 years ago. And he was prototyping, and we helped him prototype, and he prototyped some more, and he helped him prototype, and we are almost finished prototyping. <laughs> 10 years later. <laughs> and you know what, he's actually done a good job. He actually understood a lot of the things that he, were going to be difficult, and he was prepared financially. He he just had kind of the plan. He knew it was going to take a really long time, and um, you know, a lot of it. First five years of him in the garage, you know, just kind of making stuff work. Um, but really, the moral here is: complex things take time. Right? It is hard work. It is hard, and. The more moving feet parts you have, the more complex you're trying to build something. It can really take a lot of money and a lot of time. And if you're not prepared and that's not a part of your, your marketing plan and your cash flow plan and those other very integral parts, then you're not going to get there. You know, you're, you're, you're going to lose the, your reserves before you can kind of make it all the way. So if you can simplify it, do it. You know, try to get minimum viable product, try to get to market, try to get that cash flow <laughs> coming um, so that you can then put the stuff that takes more time and is more expensive off to when you have more people and more money and, and more market to sell to you. So. This is another, I think, you know, great idea, great product, um, and with really lots of possibilities, right, is that you, does, do most people know North Pants? So they're, they're kind of around here, they're a local company, um, San Francisco. They. These are sensors, 
and they're connected to a little controller. That controller you can plug in the headphones, or you can plug it into a speaker, and you can play music in your pants, so, or in your jacket, or wherever. And they've done a great job building a big library of sounds, um, and uh, so you can create music, you can jam with a band, you can jam with yourself. Um, you can also do some other very cool things, like control a slide for the slide deck. Um, or you could plug it into your house if you have a smart home, and you could control your lights. And you know, they're doing some other very cool stuff now, uh, kind of moving away from the initial direction. Um, but the, you know, the the founders had experience in China, um, having run some of an LED factory before. You know, living on the ground, speaking Chinese, and um, you know, I met them. I think. You know, eight months before they were going to start crowdfunding, and they told me where they were at, and I was like, oh, no, no, you got to get moving. No, you guys don't have much time. I'm like, eight months, all right. No, you got to really button up, you know. Give me a call, I'll help you out, I'll make a plan. Um, you know, a few months later, like five months later, I saw them three months before crowdfunding. Like, not much had changed. Like, oh, you guys, I gotta, gotta go, gotta go, don't have much time. And uh, nothing. <laughs> Two, two months after crowdfunding had finished, and they're supposed to ship, they called me out. We, we need some help. <laughs> okay, let's, let's make this happen. Um, and so we had to kind of start. I mean, they had done a lot of work. You know, they had, they had researched a lot of things. They had worked with a lot of people. They had, they had um, certainly not been just sitting around at all. Um, but it just turned out to be a much bigger, more complicated problem than they expected. And all those details, even even with all that experience, you know, really pushed back their ship date and their, you know, their initial launch to the public with their product. And um, I, you know, I think this it's, it can be hard to speed things up. I'm not sure that they could have absolutely made things a whole lot faster. Um, but it, certainly, a lot of things could have been. But but overall, you know, the important thing is if they had just known the timing, right? If they had given themselves the time, if they had prepared their market. If they prepare their funds, if they prepare their business, then it would have been a much easier problem to solve, and you know could have had a, a more successful launch and a lot of the other things associated with that. So. Right? Did they price it light on their crowdfunding? I think so. Yeah, I think um, it's always you never know cause unless you were able to do it two or three times <laughs> a little bit, right? But um, yeah, overall, according to I think market economics, typically. Um, you know, a good point to that, and I'm sure you know that, but a magic number that most people don't know is that retail is usually a four to five X on costs, on manufacturer costs, so. Markup. Markup, yeah. Um, so if you're buying something from the manufacturer for 10 bucks, you should be selling it between 40 and 50. Um, so a good way, and even a way I use a lot of times uh, to figure out how much something should cost in manufacturing, is I'll just look at something similar on the shelf, divide by four or five, you know, and I could go down and break down all the components and give decent estimates on all those things, and at the end of the day, it would just take me more time and, and probably, you know, not even be as accurate as all those little things have tolerances. So, good way to, you know, do kind of market comparison is to understand that rule of thumb. It changes at very high numbers, you know, $100, $150, so it goes down a bit, um, but, Generally, pretty amazingly consistent sort of standard. Uh, modified watches. So this is a modifiable case with modifiable straps. So the straps are silicone. Um, you know, this is a plastic, plastic case with the faceplate. And the cool thing is that you can change them out. Right? You can again very fashion oriented, so you can change the color for um, the event. You can you can now they even do one-offs. You can paint a pic, you know, uh, or print a picture of your family or or something you designed, and you can order that as a one-off and put those together. And very cool thing that they did, which really I think a lot of hardware startups can use this a lot more effectively, is the idea of customization and B2B. And so you know they came out with this product, which is really geared more towards smaller quantities. Smaller quantities are really, really tough, um, especially if you're only ordering, you know, 500 pieces of, you know, five different styles, and you need to start up your manufacturing run, and you haven't done it before, and 
factories don't want to work with those numbers and so forth. Um, so they got some early orders from bigger companies, you know, Microsoft, Google, corporate gifts. And what that allowed them to do was they were able to sell those, you know, a thousand or so to those guys. And now they can, you know, plug in their extra 400 piece order on top of that. And they can get that going, you know. Um, and the other beautiful thing is that as soon as those thousand or five thousand corporate gifts come in the door, ship them right back out, collect the money, you're ready to go. You know, you're not sitting that sitting on that inventory can take a long time. You know, you're, you never want to buy as much inventory as usually the factory will make you to get started. You buy it, so you're sitting on that, you can't sell through it. It's really eating up a lot of the cash that you need to be doing, all those other things that are now super important to marketing and, and new development and so forth. Um, this is a great way to get around that and crowdfunding as well. But if you can you know, find some way to customize and, and put a logo, you know, if, you're, if you're between that 10, maybe five, and up to you know, $40 or so price point, you know, can you sell it as a corporate gift? Sure. Um, Bright tap. So, <laughs> anyone guess what this is? Chicken feeder trigger. Yeah. So we've actually had Mark here. I don't know if you guys have seen him, but great speaker, very experienced. So he, he came from. He was a brand manager for Kraft and Xerox and some of these top companies, and he does um, stuff at home. He, he raises domestic chickens. Does a lot of gardening and a lot of other things, and he uh, saw this niche. There was no good way to give water to chickens at home. They have industrial solutions, but no one took the time to convert those industrial solutions to the domestic market because there just wasn't any any demand there. The company, certainly not for a big company. So he really focused on that niche. He, I think, you know, within like three weeks, he was number one on Google for chicken water. Within six months, he was number one, two, and three in Google for chicken and water. Um, and very quickly, he just owned the market, right? <laughs> and this is great. You know, it, it's really hard to get into a hardware business. And if you can demand a market and get to market quickly and get selling quickly and be making money quickly. I mean, this is not insignificant money, you know. The lifestyle business now, they say, is like $40 million a year, according to investors, right? So. Well, what's the design there? Is that consistent with or Google? You know, this is off the shelf. These are off the shelf. Um, he designed this housing. Uh -huh. And, you know, how we put it all together is unique. Uh, and, and how it fits into the, you know, thermos is unique. Oh, so a little bit unique. He probably has his iPad on this one. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's well protected. It's a great solution. Um, and, you know, he's, he owns the brand, right? Nobody, now if someone tries to get into chicken water, <laughs> they have a real uphill battle. You know, because he, he really knows what his customers want and he's giving to them. <laughs> um, and this is really true. So niche markets, right? It's it's so difficult to compete with big business. They've got all these skills and all these areas and all that money and all that distribution and all these relationships and everything already. But they don't apply the, that stuff to these niche markets, right? These small markets, they're not going after. It would cost them so much money to try to get into chicken waters, they, they still wouldn't make money, even though there's a lot of money for an individual or a few people to be made. Um, so we can think of you know, a way to make your product a little more niche to attract, and you know, the other things here too is that you often, if you have specific interests, you know, you're interested in this kind of one slightly less popular thing, then you know the community, right? You know the customer, you know, what makes that work and why it's exciting. And so you can really connect with that community better than a big company can because you, you really know that target. You can speak the lingo and you can create that brand identity you know, that makes it work. So, so um, that is it. So, thank you guys.